Um, so what I'd like to do is draw upon 55 years of being on staff and 55 years of research. I spent over $300,000 a year researching. I don't know any other author or speaker that has even come close to that in history. But you don't do five books a year for 20 years and not do research, especially when you document everything. So what I would like to do is draw upon 55 years in ministry to see where we are today. What are we facing today? How can we overcome it? And uh, I believe one of my gifts God has given me is gift of understanding culture. In my country, a lot of people call me a prophet. I'm not. I read stats. Stats don't lie, people do. Guns don't kill. Daddies with daughters with guns kill. That's a joke, folks. <laughs> I want to use the internet here. Let me, uh, I don't know how you worship God without an iPad. I just don't. I want to use PowerPoint. Uh, I'm going to be brief, and I want to have time for uh, Q and A. If we don't understand how we got to where we are, it is difficult to understand how to get where we need to be. If you do what you've always done, you'll have what you've always had. And to me, change is empowering, especially in the day of the internet. Change is empowering. Most people don't like to change because we gain security and comfort in doing the same thing over and over and over again. I would get totally bored in that situation. Uh, excitement is change. It's adapting. It's moving with the culture. Truth never changes. But how you present it better change. Or you become obsolete. Truth doesn't, but you do. So how do we get to where we are? And in going through this, you'll see where we are. We not only have, in almost every culture of the world, because of the internet, the internet has changed Everything. For the most part, and a lot of people internationally don't appreciate when I say this, but even in China, I'll tell them, I'll tell the government officials, uh, your culture is irrelevant. All the time, the one thing you never say to me, well, it's different in our culture. We do it differently. You never say that to me. I'll bury you. Because that, well, all that says to me is you're irrelevant. Culture is irrelevant. American culture, African culture, European culture, Chinese culture, Philippine is irrelevant to those 35 and younger. For those 35 and younger, there's only one culture in the world, Facebook. No, I'm serious. And one thing I've learned, if you are not willing to rise above your culture, and speak truth back into it, then why don't you go sell used cars? If you're not willing to rise above your culture and speak truth back into it, to me, you're meaningless. I thank God for Martin Luther King Jr., who in my culture, his black culture, he was willing to rise above it and speak truth back into it. And boy, his sermon he gave on the mountaintop. Whew. Or I've had a dream. He spoke truth back into his culture. In most cultures of the world, when it comes to Christianity, we don't have people doing that. So how do we get to where we are? We have two generations. We've always had two generations everywhere. Adults and youth, parents and kids. We've always had that. 
But now, in almost every country of the world, for the first time in history, we not only have two generations, we have two absolutely distinct cultures. Adult culture and youth culture. Culture of the parents and the culture of the kids. And for the most part, they're not transposing these cultures. Let me give you a brief lesson in history as best as I can see it. For hundreds of years, this was the paradigm of truth. On these video screens, the video screens of history at the top, you have a personal creator God. For hundreds of years, the truth was that all truth resides in a personal creator God. Economic truth, social truth, history truth, scientific truth, metaphysical truth, philosophic truth, theological truth, everything resides in a personal creator God. Then there was created man who responded to that. Now this was mainly in the Western world. But the problem is, I'll have some pastor leaders say to me when I get to a couple of these movements in the world, say, well, that never affected China, never affected Asia. I said, get your head screwed on straight. The internet has brought every single movement in history to the Philippines. You probably can't name it, but you've been affected by it through the internet. So here you had a personal creator God, created man who responded to that personal creator God. Then onto the scene in most parts of the world, not all, came the Renaissance. The Renaissance says, we don't need God. Why? See how great man is. This is when they started doing statues and images of the human body and all. And what the in, uh, Renaissance did was bring the concept of personal creator God about a quarter of the way down history and elevated man. And it wouldn't go on further than that if it hadn't been followed years later by the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment came onto the world scene, not everywhere. It's now affected everywhere, but not at the time. Came onto the scene and said, we don't need God. Why? Now notice the difference. See how great man can reason. He can reason through the sin problem, reason through salvation. Probably the best graphic I've ever seen of the Enlightenment is a quite a famous graphic of a captain of a ship, an old ship in a huge storm. And Jesus standing there with his arm almost on his shoulder. And the caption read, Jesus is the master of my destiny. What the Enlightenment did was take that arm off. And the title reads, I am the master of my destiny. And what the Enlightenment did was bring the concept personal creator of God further down in history and elevated man. And then it was followed by a movement that did not affect Asia at the time. Now it has. It's affected China in a big way, everything. It's a movement that most even philosophers did not see the philosophical implications of it. They didn't see the cultural implications. And I believe this movement ended about 1994. It's pretty recent. Called the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution came onto the scene, said, we don't need God. Why? Don't notice the difference. See how great man can create. These were the days of the huge machines, of patents, everything. And what the Industrial Revolution did was bring a personal creator God another quarter of the way down history and elevate a man. But there were two questions none of them can answer. Now, there was other movements in here all over the world, but I've narrowed these three down to the greatest emphasis of where we are today, and one more. They couldn't answer two questions, the origin of man and the origin of the universe. At the turn of the previous century came Darwinism, evolution. Evolution came on the scene and I'm using my words carefully here, we don't even need a concept of a personal creator God. And with that, the concept, there's a personal creator God which all truth resides, fell off the video screen of history. And it left created man. 
Can anyone tell me philosophically, what is that called? When the image of a person who created God fell off the video screen here, anyone? Philosophically, what is that called? The God is dead movement. The God is dead movement and evangelists and preachers and say, oh, sure, God was alive and he died. That has nothing to do with it. The God is dead movement is that the concept, there's a personal creator God and with all truth resides, that concept died. And it left created man. You can trace all over the world now, 40 years ago, you couldn't have. Now you can because of the internet. You can trace almost every line of thought of young people, 35 and under, back to this progression of history, degression, actually, of history. So how do you mean? OK, what is the number one virtue in the world? far greater than freedom, justice, anything has ever dreamed of being. What is the number one virtue in the world now? You can't even be a member of the United Nations if your country does not endorse it. Can anyone tell me what it is? What? Speak up, I can't hear you up here. Tolerance. is believed by more people, accepted by more people, more countries, more cultures, than any virtue in history. And it came right out of this progression historically. How? I've written two books on tolerance. First one is called The New Tolerance. The last one is called The Beauty of Intolerance. And I wrote that with my son. The first book called The New Tolerance, I wrote it mainly for Christians. Christian leaders, pastors, they weren't getting it. They were still living under the ancient concept of tolerance. The concept of tolerance has completely changed 1,000% because of this progression of history. Tolerance now means all values, all beliefs, all lifestyles, all claims to truth are equal. And if you dare to say there's a value, a belief, a lifestyle, or claim to truth greater or lesser than another, then today you are labeled a bigot and intolerant. Why? You made a moral judgment. Came right out of here. Because how can one man say to another man, your lifestyle of transgender, homosexual, whatever, is wrong. How can you say that? Where's your external reference point? There is none. Fell off the video screen of history. Who are you to judge me? Who are you to tell me what is right or wrong? You need to leave out what you believe is right or wrong. You need to give me the freedom to live out what I believe. Why? Because where's your external reference point? You're only imposing your view, your perspective, your opinion upon me. And how dare you do that? You are intolerant. Out of this came the second, one of the second greatest virtues in history, multiculturalism. Multiculturalism has absolutely nothing to do with the color of your skin. Has absolutely nothing to do with your ethnic background, or racial background has not yet every Christian everybody thinks that's what it is has nothing to do with that multiculturalism is tolerance applied to culture now what does that mean it means culturally all cultural values are equal all cultural beliefs are equal all cultural lifestyles are equal all cultural claims to truth are equal. And if you dare to say your culture has a better value or less value than something of any other culture, then you are anti-multiculturalism and you're a bigot. All came out of this progression because where's your external reference point?
Before I go to the next one, let me show you how this has affected us. Because the next point is how this has become global. I better go to the next point first, then come back and show how this is manifested in culture. Because you cannot understand any thought process today without the internet. You just can't. It, it, I think it's impossible. It's changed everything. The second one is a massive data glut. The introduction of the global internet. The emergence of the internet. Every time I get a stat and I make a PowerPoint and use it one time, it's obsolete. It's obsolete. Everything I'm going to be sharing here at the conference I'm here to speak to is obsolete. And some of it just came up with five, six days ago. It's obsolete already. The internet is changing so fast. For example, this number of 3.3 um, billion people on the internet, now it's more like 4, 4.3 billion, almost overnight. People say, well, it's going to slow down. No, it isn't. Look at this chart. This is done by the experts. And it says, the size of the internet's not going to slow down. It's going to go right through the roof. Just to show you the, the pace of change technologically leading up to the internet, how long did it take a new technology to reach 50 million people, historically? How long did it take? For a new technology to reach 50 million people. For the radio, it took 38 years. Telephone, 20 years. Television, 13 years. The World Wide Web, four years. Facebook, 3.6 years. Twitter, three years. iPad, two years. Google, 88 days. Pokemon Go, nine days. Do you get the point? In our ministry, we use technology. Oh my gosh. And I'm not even talking about the internet. We use about five, six things of technology, some of which we help develop to reach people for Christ and everything and the discipleship. In the last six years, using six electronic devices, not the internet, it has nothing to do with the internet, 152 million people have downloaded my resources. That's never happened in history to anyone or any organization in the last 12 months. Oh, 25,788,000 people in the last 12 months have downloaded my resources. That's never even come close to anything, anyone, any resources in history. And not even when you add the internet to it, it'll go up millions more. But I'm just talking about technology apart from the internet. And somebody asked me the other day about the future. I said, look, what we'll be using in three to four years probably hasn't even been, even been thought of right now. It's changing that fast. I can guarantee you within five years that technology that Josh McDowell Ministry will be using, nobody's even thought of it yet. That's how fast history is moving. For example, with the internet, how big is it? Nobody knows. The experts don't know. Because the moment you think you know, it's so much bigger. A second later. So I tried my best with the experts, with the numbers people, the scientists, figure out how big is the internet. This was two and a half years ago. It came out. Every 24 hours in a global internet, it processes 1.7 quadrillion gigabytes of data. Most of you folks, many of you don't even know what a gigabyte is. I mean, uh, quadrillion is. We never think of that. Now think of it. 1.742 quadrillion gigabytes of data. A gigabyte is basically 64,782 Eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper with printed data on it. 
So you take and multiply that out with 1.742 quadrillion gigabytes, it comes out every 24 hours, 112 sextillion pages of processed data every 24 hours. Folks, we can't even, you can't even think that. You can't even process that. You are in competition with all of that. You are, Ilya. Every pastor is. Every speaker, every author is in competition with that. No one of influence has ever had so much competition in the history of the world. That means 4.7026 sextillion pages per hour. 78 quintillion per minute. 1.306 quintillion pages every second. Some scientists try to figure out, if you stop the internet right this moment, printer, what's on the internet right this minute? On eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, how tall would it go? 8,300 miles, that's about 11,000 kilometers. It would take 16 trillion trees. This is what gets me. The average time of an adolescent on the internet. In 2012, it was 18 hours a week. 2014, 42 hours a week. 2015, 77 hours a week. That affects everything you believe. It affects all your emotional health, everything. No people ministering in universities, in the villages and all, has ever faced this before. Hours of video uploaded every minute. In 2015, now this is way dwarfed, is now way over 600. It's 400 hours every minute uploaded to the internet. Only, that's only YouTube. That means every hour just on one website, 24,000 hours of video is uploaded on one website for one purpose, to influence people. We are all in competition with that. My heart goes out to pastors. I don't know how youth pastors do it. 25, 30 years ago, we could do a video, create a movie, spend a lot of money for it, and it would be popular and stay for 10 years. Now you're lucky nine months. You know what that means every day? 576,000 hours of video uploaded just one website, YouTube, every 24 hours. Wow. Videos watched on an average on YouTube. Last year it was 1.5 trillion videos. That affects every one of your ministries. That affects your family, your children, everything. Every second, 116,000 videos. That's just one website. Look at Google. Just one of many search sites. In 2013, search is 1.2 billion. 2014, 2.4 billion. 2015, 1.1 trillion. Who knows what it is today? It's probably around 1.7 trillion. That's why no longer is the Bible the number one source of truth. No longer is the home, the church, the school, the number one source of sex education. It's Google. Right there. Wikipedia. Don't ever laugh at Wikipedia. It's huge. Huge. And it's one all over the world, one of three sources people go to, young people go to for truth. That's scary. 
What has the internet done? One, it's leveled the playing field. 35, 40 years ago, atheists, agnostics, people that hate everything that you and I stand for, had very little access to our children. Except maybe in the last year or two of the university. If they wrote a book, nobody wrote it. If they had a seminar, nobody went to it hardly. Now, it's one click away. Right now, atheists, agnostics have almost the same access to our children that we have. One click away. To some of the most profound arguments against your faith. The 95% of Christians can't answer. There's answers for it. There's answers for every issue I've ever seen on the internet. But the problem is 95% of Christians, especially young people, don't know the answers. Second, it's capturing the mind of children younger and younger and younger. Let me show you what I mean. And I think I have the background to make these statements more than anyone else in history. I've lectured in over 1,260 some universities in the world. Probably no one else in history has lectured in 300. I've done over 250 debates around the world with heads of philosophy departments, science departments, etc. And so I have a background to say this. 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago, the questions that I heard in the universities about truth, about Christianity, the resurrection, the scriptures, Christ and all, I'm now hearing at 11, 12, 13 years old. Why? The internet has taken it younger and younger and younger. This is why, if you are not more equipped than those in Crusade in the Philippines 15 years ago, if you're not more equipped now to ish deal with some of these issues, then you're out of God's will. Third, it's created the most incredible intellectual skepticism. Go with me to a middle school, high school, college, and just listen. Now you have to make dogmatic statements. You gotta really be dogmatic. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. The Bible is the only word of God. You gotta really be dogmatic. Even among Christians, you hear this. How do you know that's true? There's so much out there. Tomorrow, they could find something new. They could discover something new next week. Of the most spiritual Christians is starting to shake their faith. And then fourth, is taking a person coming to Christ at a younger, 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 younger age. In my country, there's no evidence to show it's not true in most countries. In my country, 30 years ago, anybody came in to raise money for a youth ministry, for a youth building, for a church, whatever, you always heard this. You've got to invest. If we don't reach them by 18, you won't reach them. You know what it is now? If you don't reach them by their 12th birthday, you probably won't reach them. Why? Because 25, 30 years ago in the United States, if you didn't reach a child by their 12th birthday, 36% would still come to Christ. You know what it is now? 4%. Why? The internet. They're being exposed younger and younger and younger. And we need to equip ourselves to deal with that. Now, how is all this affecting culture? Let me go back now. It's affected almost every type of belief in culture around the world. If I was leading an adult Bible study, which you all are adults here, I would lead it this way. Well, when Jesus said this, what did he mean by that? Well, when Paul wrote this, what did he mean by that? Have you sat Youth, especially younger youth, 
Yeah, 21 years old and younger. Bible studies, interaction groups, except in a reverse situation goes like this. Well, when Jesus said this, what does that mean to you? What do you mean? What does that mean to you? It doesn't matter what it meant, means to you. It's what it means to Jesus. How does it apply to you? Well, when Paul wrote this, what does that mean to you? The issue is, what did it mean to Jesus? How does it apply to you? Now, why that shift for this reason? It doesn't matter what it meant to Jesus. Because where's your external reference point? All truth is personal opinion, personal perspective, personal feeling, personal emotion. It doesn't matter what it meant to Jesus, because in almost all cultures today, whatever it means to you is just as authentic and real as whatever it meant to Jesus. Because all truth is personal opinion, personal feeling, personal emotion. Let me show you how that's manifested. In Star Wars, which are popular all over the world, George Lucas, the founder, was being interviewed. And he talked about, what's the secret of Star Wars? He said, well, what's the word he used? To enter or to understand all the truth, you must rely upon your feelings. And that's what the whole thing's based on. My son, I hear he's coming to Manila soon. He's the speaker for a huge youth convention here. If you can hear him, the kid is good. No, I know almost every speaker in America. I mentored so many of them. They attended my communication seminars. And I say Sean is one of the top five speakers in America. I won't tell you who the other four are. <laughs> He's brilliant. He is brilliant. Two masters, PhD, straight 100s. In fact, with his PhD, they cut out half of the entire program because he knew more than the profs did. No, I'm serious. He did it in half the time, his PhD. But boy, can he communicate. Oh, wow, can he communicate. And he's got his marriage together and he has his family together, his three kids. And uh, he's my sounding block now. I don't know one person in the world, including Ravi Zacharias, when I'm struggling with an issue on truth, metaphysics, or something else, historical evidence, I just can't grasp it. The number one person I call in the world now is my son, Sean. He's my sounding block. And about nine months ago, I called him. And I said, son, I need your input. I said, I'm a researcher. I spent 55 years just researching. And I said, recently, Sean, I concluded that the same sex debate is starting to take place everywhere in the world. Why? The internet. It's a huge problem in, in, in uh, Singapore. Oh my gosh, China now, everywhere. I said, son, as far as I can recall, now listen to this, it's the first time historically where feelings trumped science. Where feelings trumped truth and facts. There's a little pause and he said, Dad, you're right. And it goes back to this progression of history. Where's your objective external reference? There is none, they say. So what do you rely upon? Your feelings. There's this book out. It's called Fire and Fury in the White House, Criticizing Trump. And on MSNBC, the author was being re interviewed a few days ago. See if you can catch this. I don't think anyone in the United States caught it. I really don't. I don't think the interviewer caught it, any of the professors, because they're so ingrained. The interviewer started out by saying, your recent book that just came out has really been defrocked. 
They're showing us so much in it is false, never happened, you made it up. You don't have documentation on it or anything. What do you have to say about it? Listen to his answer. I don't think anyone got it. He said, look, just read it. And if it rings true to you, then it's true. Do you get that? How serious that is? And the journalist wasn't even smart enough to come back with an answer, with a question. And most in the universities aren't. It has switched from truth, even science, to feelings and emotions. In British Columbia, Canada, the province, they just passed a law that parents can order, this is so sad, gender-free birth certificates. You know why they did it? Right bit into the law? You need to make parents feel comfortable. It's gone away from objective truth. This is why, you're gonna see this in the Philippines. So keep your mind on, you're gonna see this. I'm apologist. I love apologetics, I really do. Presenting forth truth, why you should believe. But the biggest question now, and I would say half the world, pretty soon it'll be in everywhere, by young people, high school and college is not, is Christianity true? But rather the question is, is Christianity good? And I know very few people who have an apologetic for that. How do we get there? The internet has exposed everything negative about Christianity. The Crusades and all, the way in many countries, the church, Christians have handled the same sex issue, the transgender and all. And the world is watching, say, if that's Christianity, it's evil. I don't want anything to do with it. It's not what they say, it's how they say it. And so young people now in the back of them, okay, you can talk to me all you want about it, it's true, but is it good? Comes right back to this progression. This will be, in every country of the world, our future epistemology. Epistemology is a big word with little meanings. All big words have little meanings. They're big words for frustrated professors. Epistemology means the study of the meaning and source of truth. What is truth? Where does it come from? We're having a total shift from objective reality, the scriptures, etc., science, etc., to internal, your feelings. What do you do? I want to wrap it up in four minutes. Throw it on for questions. I wrote a book on it. This one, when you asked me, what is the most significant book or whatever you read? Unshakable Truth. I asked Sean to join with me on it because I knew no one generation could write that book. <laughs> How do you present truth in the 21st century? To be accepted as truth in a culture of feelings and emotions and personal. I read every book out there on worldview by Christians, great authors, because all research shows the number one thing that affects the change of your behavior is your worldview. Isn't that amazing? Your worldview. And every book I read on worldview, I would it was a great book. Both the authors are friends of mine and everything. Have you ever put down a book and just say to yourself, there's something missing? Just there's something wrong. There's some, every book by great author, I put in there's something, you know what it was? They, every one of them had a false premise. What was their false premise? The first century church. Say what? Yeah. Everybody goes back as their model for a worldview, the first century church. You could say the first century church was a failure. In the first 100 years of Christianity, 100 years, there were about 25,000 believers. 
Next 200 years, there were 25 million. What happened? If you want to study what happened, don't go back to the first century church. Go back to the second century church. A man came onto the scene, Justin Martyr. He said to the church, we got a problem. We're not doing two things. One, we're not creating true followers of Jesus Christ. Same thing Bill Heibel said of the huge church in Chicago. After they did a study of his own people, he said, our motto of 30 years of ministry has failed. Dr. Bill Heibel saying that. He said, we haven't created true followers of Christ in the church. Second, Justin Martyr and Bill Heibel said the same thing. You think he was copying Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr said, second, we have not created a generation that is passing their faith on to the next generation. He uttered three words that I explain in the book. Believe, behave, belong. Those three words turn the world upside down. How do these three words, I'm not going to go into detail here now. How these three words came four principles to teach 12 truths. Justin Martyr said, you cannot create true followers of Jesus Christ if you do not incorporate 12 truths into their life. I thought, ridiculous. I was thinking it was more like seven or eight. And then I read it and I said, oh my gosh, he's right. Any one of these 12 truths is missing. It'd be hard to ever be a true follower of Jesus Christ. So how do you teach the 12 truths? Out of those three words came four principles. One, say the truth is God. First question, what do you need to know about that truth, in this case, God, to become a true follower of Jesus Christ? Most people say right away, oh, well, God is love, God is holy. No, no. Justin Martyr said, and it's true, he said, what's the first thing God revealed about himself? He's a creator God. In the beginning, God created. He said, that's the most critical thing you must pass on to anyone, because when you understand a true creator God, it means meaning and purpose. So the first question to anyone, whether it's the resurrection, incarnate, whatever, what does a person need to know about that subject to become a true follower of Christ? Second, how do you know it's true? Apologetics. Way back with Justin Martyr. How do you know it's true? So God is a creator God. So God is love. How in the world do you even know that's true? So Christ was raised again. How do you, so he's born of birth. How in the world do you even know that's true? Third principle, and this is what really made Justin Martyr unique and unique today that you almost never hear. The third question you ask is, so what? So what? Okay, God is a creator God, a God of love, a righteous God, holy God. So what? It's all true. How does it affect me? So what? Whoa. You hardly ever hear a pastor mention that. The fourth question, how can I experience it in community? In the church, in the world. How can I experience it? One, in relationship with the truth giver. Second, in relationship with the world, the body of Christ. I've read about every book out there on preaching and teaching and everything else. I don't think there's anything out there that matches it biblically and culturally. What do you need to know? How do you know it's true? So what? And how can I experience it in community? Because you've got to experience Christianity in community. Well, this is how I see the world where we are right now. And I realize we need to raise a generation that's more profound because of the, the questions the internet is bringing up about truth, everything. Otherwise, we're superficial. Second, we got to raise a group of believers and leaders who are truly authentic. The new generation coming up 21 years old and younger, and it's almost the same all over the world, called Generation Z. I like to call my gen, internet generation. 
They're the first generation 1,000% raised on the internet with a moving screen. Truth everything. I'm just finishing. I would love to send it to you. I'm going to send it to Peter. I hope within two weeks to have it done. It's I just finished a document on millennials. How do you understand millennials? They're different. Now I'm doing a document. It's about 100. It'll be about 150 pages. How do you understand and reach Generation Z? Folks, this coming generation, there's a greater difference between millennials and Generation Z than there's ever been with any generation in history. Do you hear me? You don't reach Generation Z the way you've reached the millennial generation. And if ministries don't change, they'll pay the price. For example, Generation Z. One, 30, two or 33% totally identify with bisexual. I think it's 37% identify with transgender. For millennials, it was 8%. <laughs> Folks, that's a whole new world you want to present truth in. Other, and this is hard to understand. I understand it now. But it's skyrocketed with mental health. It's left the millennial generation in the dust on mental health standards. It's gone off the charts. Huge in one generation. This next generation, for the most part, they're drinking less. They're not going to parties as much. They're not driving as much. They don't have as many accidents. And they're not spending time with their friends, physical friends. As generation millennial, millennial generation, it's totally different. Why? To the upcoming Generation Z, their heaven, their, um, oh, come on, wait, karma is in their bedroom with the door closed with their iPhone. They're driving less. They're starting to leave the house less, going to fewer parties, drinking less. Why? As most of them will say, their connection on the internet is more important to them than their personal friends. One reason for the mental health, it's just one of many, but it's one of the main reasons that psychologists, psychiatrists come up with is the stress factor. You see, it's taken acceptance and everything from taking weeks, months to be accepted down to a few seconds. From the time you place your picture, whatever, on the internet to the time a few seconds later you start getting likes or dislikes, those few seconds are starting to affect their mental health. There is such tremendous stress to be unliked. This is the first true curator generation. They're curating, they're creating who they are and the way they want to be looked at and not who they really are. The book that helped you is going to even become more valuable in the future on self-image. So folks, what a day to be alive. No. I love a good fight. Oh, man, I run towards conflict. I don't run from it. My wife hides from it. But what a day to be calm like you are and I am to do what we do in a changing culture where people are crying out for answers, and we ultimately have it in Jesus.